chapter number 9. John chapter number 9 in our Bibles. If you'd like to follow along with the sermon, we have some notes on a QR code on the screen behind me, as well as in your bulletin. John chapter number 8 left off with Jesus Christ declaring himself to be Jehovah God, and the religious leaders got so angry with this statement that Jesus made that they tried to stone him. But Jesus escapes their murder attempt and gets out of the temple area. It says in verse number 58 of John 8, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. As he's escaping he and leaving the temple, the Bible tells us, picking up in John 9, verse number 1, that he noticed a blind man. And as Jesus passed by, notice that, chapter number 8, verse 59, closes with, and so passed by. And chapter 9, verse 1, picks up as Jesus passed by. He's escaping. He's fleeing from these guys, trying to stone him and kill him. And as he passes by, he's getting away from there. Notice what happens. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. This man was a nobody. He was an outcast of society. Most people, including the disciples, would never have even given this man a, a second thought. From what we see in this text, though, it doesn't seem that this man called out to Jesus Christ to get his attention. It seems like it was Jesus who initiated the contact. You know, there is nobody that is insignificant to Jesus Christ. There's nobody that's not important to Jesus Christ. And maybe as Jesus was passing by this man, he, he stopped and he, he noticed him. Remember, he's, he's fleeing, he's running out of there, but he sees this man. And he draws attention to this man, maybe patted him on the head. Maybe he gave him a coin, but he did something that caused the disciples to notice this man. Because it says in verse number two, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? We don't know how the disciples knew about this man's condition how that he had been born blind. Uh, maybe they had met this man at a different time. Maybe he was a, a friend of a friend. Uh, we don't know what happened, but, but they knew of his condition, that he had been born blind. And Jewish teaching during this time taught that physical disability, like a blindness, was the result of personal sin. We know that all sickness, all disabilities, are the result of sin but not necessarily the result of personal sin. Uh, we didn't, uh, if we didn't have a body of sin that we inherited from Adam's first sin in the fall, there would be no physical suffering. There would be no death. Uh, there would be no disabilities. There would be no suffering at all. And so while physical suffering is the result of sin in general, the physical suffering is not all physical suffering is the result of personal sin. But Jewish belief at this time taught that if someone was suffering physically, it was the result of a sin that they had committed, not the general sin that of sin nature that is passed from one man to the next. They said, if, if you have a back problem, it's because you sin. If you have a problem with your arm, it's because you've done something wrong. If you were born blind, you must have really messed up, or if you're blind of somehow. It, but and so they passed down sin as a result of disability. But they had a dilemma. How could somebody sin if they were born that way? Who sinned? Was it the baby while he was still in the womb? Could baby sin in the womb to cause a blindness? Or did the mom and dad sin? Uh, to cause this, this baby to, to be born blind. And there was a discussion, there was an argument. Would God pass down the sin of the parents uh, to the children? That goes against what the Bible tells us in, in the book of Deuteronomy. And so they, they, were, they were wrestling with this. They had a dilemma. They believed that all suffering was a result of personal sin. But what about people that were born that way? Who sinned as a result? And so the disciples, having grown up with this tradition, with this belief and this conflict, Look to Jesus Christ for the answer. And they asked him, in verse number two, who, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
And Jesus answered them, Neither has this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. The reason that this man was born blind was not because of personal sin. The reason that this man was born blind was because God wanted to bring glory to his name. See, not all physical suffering is a judgment of God. Is there physical suffering that's the judgment of God? Yes, there is. But not all physical suffering is the result of, of God. And you would think that these religious leaders, they would know that. They knew their Bibles. Had they not read the book of Job? Uh, Job was not punished by God, and yet he suffered greatly. God allowed it in his life. And Jesus tells them that this man was born blind to manifest the glory of God. God allowed this man's physical suffering to, be, to later be used for his glory. We don't know how long this man was born blind, how long this man was blind. As we'll see in some later verses, he was now old enough to give an account of himself. He's now an adult. So it's pretty clear that he suffered for quite a while. And I think we can all be in agreement that, that suffering stinks, right? Uh, we don't enjoy suffering. We don't wake up with our, our back pains and our arm pains and our headaches and go, oh, that's so great. Oh, that's so fun. Suffering is not fun. Suffering hurts. The other day I, I went to get up and, and close the, the recliner on my chair and all of a sudden my knee hurt. And I thought, what happened? I've gotten older, and it's not fun. Pain is not good. Suffering is not enjoyable for us. We don't like it. And sometimes we're like Job. And we don't know why we're suffering. We don't understand what, what, why, is, what, why what is happening to us is happening to us. And God may allow us to suffer for a long time like this blind man, or even suffer greatly, even though we did nothing to deserve it. But we have to remember that he is allowing it for a purpose, to bring glory to his name. God works all things together for good. God is in control. He is sovereign. He's almighty. He has a purpose. He has a plan. And he's using it for a reason, even though we might not understand. And we may never understand the reasoning behind it. The glory that this man's suffering would manifest is the power and glory of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me, Jesus is speaking, while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. We remember that statement from John chapter number 8. When Jesus said in, in verse number 12 of, of John 8, he said, Then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. The light of life. So now Jesus Christ is going to use this physical condition, this man being born, in, being born blind, to bring a illustration to the hearts and the mind of people what he is trying to teach that he is the one that is the light of the world he is the one that helps people to no longer walk in darkness but to have the light of life and so this man was living in darkness he was born in darkness from, his, from the very beginning, he could not see. And Jesus Christ is about to introduce to him physical light and introduce to him spiritual light by opening his eyes and use it as an illustration to help the Jews that are around him, the religious Pharisees, to understand what he is offering, what he is saying, that he is the light of the world. This morning, we're going to step through this event and consider two truths. I was blind, now I see, and we see, now we're blind. Let's look at the first truth. I was blind, but now I see. The blind man was about to have his life completely transformed. As Jesus finished talking to the disciples, he does this a miraculous work. It says in verse number six, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Jesus Christ spits on the ground, makes some mud and put paste on the guy's eyes. My wife goes, why could he do a different way? Why did he have to spit on the ground and use that? 
we don't know why Jesus did it this way. Jesus Christ very easily could have said, see, and the guy would have been made to see. But for some reason, he chooses to make some clay and put it on the guy's eyes. Maybe he did it as a test of obedience to the blind man. Would he trust Jesus and do what Jesus asked him to do? Maybe he did it because it would be considered a work by the religious leaders and therefore forbidden because this was the Sabbath day, as we'll see as the story unfolds. And Jesus is trying to show the hard-heartedness of the religious leaders. We don't know why he used the clay. We also also don't know why he sent them down to the pool of Siloam. It doesn't seem to have any great significance. Maybe the man, he was blind. He didn't know how to get to any other pool. That was the only place he knew how to, to get to. Maybe he was sent there because he knew other people would re recognize the blind man who was now healed. Maybe he was just sent there because that was the closest area to go to to get water to wash his eyes. We don't know all the whys. We simply know what Jesus Christ did. And what we do know is that after this man washed this clay off of his eyes, for the first time in his life, he could see. And unfortunately, John doesn't record, doesn't include this man's reaction. What was that like? This man who had been born blind, all of a sudden opens his eyes, and he can see. Could you imagine what that was like? Could you imagine how that must have been? Have you ever seen... Those videos of those, the people who are born colorblind and they put those glasses on that, that help them to see color for the first time and the reaction. Wow. I didn't know all that. Or that little child that has never been able to hear and they, they put that implant in there and they, mom starts speaking, that child hears noise. And, oh, wow. And here's this blind man for the first time in his life. He's now an adult opens his eyes and he can see what did he do did he jump for joy did he start shouting did he start running around did he fall down did he start touching stuff and go oh that's what that is i didn't know what that looked like i didn't know how that was oh that's a lot different than what i thought it was did he start feeling things we don't know what his reaction was and though we don't know a lot what we do know is that when he returned to where he had been, he was now different. He could now see. And the people who had seen him before and had known him before knew that he was different. Because when God touches the life and changes the life of someone, they are different. Jesus Christ makes us different. He was so different that they assumed he couldn't be the same man. It says in verse number 8, the neighbors therefore, and they which had seen him that, was, that he was blind said, is this not he that sat and begged? And notice verse 9, some said, this is he. Others said, oh, he's like him. That can't really be him. I, I mean, this guy's been blind all his life. He just looks like him. He's similar to him. It can't be him. And the blind man listening to these people arguing goes, guys, it's me. I was the guy that was blind, and now I can see. He looked the same. He wore the same clothes, but he was now different. He could now see. And so they thought it couldn't be the same man, because when Jesus Christ changes us, people look and they go, they look the same. Wow, that very same. But they're different. Jesus touched them and changed their lives. And so the man says, no, it's me, and it, and it shocks them. And, of course, their first question is verse number 10. Therefore they said unto him, how? How were your eyes open? What happened? How did this happen to you? And the former blind man explains what Jesus Christ had done. And so now they ask, well, where is he? In verse number 12, they said, where is Jesus? Where is he? And the blind man says, I don't know. The people that knew the blind man and knew that something miraculous had just happened are now overwhelmed and they're, they're trying to figure out what's going on. And so it seems their initial reaction says, we need to get some answers. And so verse number 13 tells us that he, they take him to the religious leaders. And they say, hey, look, there was this guy that was born blind and now he could see. The Bible doesn't tell us why. 
they took them to the religious leaders. Maybe they were trying to get answers. Something happened and they're trying to get answers. Maybe they were trying to antagonize them. Maybe they had started to hear about Jesus and believe in Jesus Christ. And they're bringing this man and saying, now what do you say about Jesus? Now what are you going to say about him? We don't know all the reasons, but they now take the blind man to the Pharisees and they say, what happens? And the fun begins. This is such an amazing passage. This is such a fun story. The Pharisees receive the man and they ask him, what happened? And in verse number 14, it says, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said unto them, he put clay on mine eyes and I washed and do see but because it was the Sabbath day, some of the religious leaders deemed that, that this could not be a work of God. There's no way that God could have done this because that was a work. You weren't allowed to work on the Sabbath day. And Jesus Christ spit, he made dirt, he made some mud, and he, he put it on the guy's eyes. You're not allowed to do that. And so they said it can't be a work of God. In verse 16 it says, Therefore, said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keeps not the Sabbath day. Others said... How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. And so now they go to the blind man. And they say, what do you think? You were the one that this happened to. What do you think happened? Who is this? But he doesn't know who Jesus is. He doesn't know that Je what Jesus has been saying or teaching. All he knows is that he was blind and that Jesus healed him. So he had to be a prophet of, of some sort. He had to be a, like Moses or Elijah. As it says in verse number 17 at the end, it says, he said he is a prophet. He's like one of the men of old who does miraculous things. He didn't know everything about Jesus Christ. And some of these religious guys hearing this testimony go, this can't be true. They're making this up. There's no way that this man who was born blind can now, can now see. This has never happened. He's got to be making this up. Let's, let's do some investigative work. Let's figure this out. So they call, they go and find the guy's parents, the blind man's parents, and they bring them before him. And they ask the, the parents, was this guy really born blind? Yes, yes he was. Well, what happened to him? All we know is what he told us. We weren't there. We didn't see what happened. Uh, we weren't partaking of that. And the Bible tells us that they were afraid of the Pharisees because they were afraid of being kicked out. In verse number 22 of John chapter number 9, it says, These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. They, they didn't want to commit financial and, su and social suicide. Uh, they didn't want to be kicked out of the synagogue because that would have made their life a lot more difficult. They would have lost some privileges. And so they said, uh, we don't know what happened, but he's old enough. You just need to talk to him. They, they were passing the buck. They didn't want to be dragged into this event. That, that's shocking. That is so heartbreaking. Here are his parents whose child can now see. And instead of saying, we don't know, but he can see. Praise God, this guy Jesus must be awesome. They were so worried about themselves and the consequences that would come to themselves. They said, hey, we don't want anything to do with this. We want no part of this. You go and talk to him yourself. And they send it, so they go back to the, the, the blind man. And they call him back to him and told, them, and told him to reject God. In verse number 24. It says, and then they again called they the man that was born blind and said unto him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Wow. And I love the blind man's response in verse 25. Whether he be a sinner or no, I don't know. One thing I do know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Oh, what a great answer. Guys, I don't know all this stuff. I don't know, even know who he was. Hey, you asked me, I said, maybe he's a prophet because something amazing happened. I don't know everything. All I know is that I was blind all my life. And now I can see your face. Ugh. Now I can see what you're like. He could now see his life had been transformed. And then he goes in verse number 27. I have told you already. They said, well, how did he open your eyes? And he said, I told you already. And you didn't hear it. Wherefore would you hear it again? 
Will you also be his disciples? Do you guys want to follow him? Is that why you're asking me all these questions? Or are you guys trying to follow him? And this really sets them off. The religious leaders in verse 28, they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we don't even know where he's from. Remember, they go back to this over and over again. We don't even know where this guy's from. Uh, who's his parents? Where does he come from? What's he about? We know nothing about this guy. They were so convinced that healing people on the Sabbath day was against the law of Moses, but they, they could not reconcile Jesus sinning and doing a miracle of God at the same time. Why God would use this, this guy? And so the man simply responds, look, I don't know all the Mosaic laws. I'm not sure about all this Sabbath day stuff, but something amazing happened to me. Something has never happened in the history of the world. I was blind, but now I see. So that has to be of God. He said in verse number 33, If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. So the religious leaders have enough. How dare this man who was born a sinner teach these men of God, these men who kept the law, these men who followed Moses' teaching, the blind man who had been born into sin for, for a physical illness that only came as a result of sin is according to their beliefs and what they believed. How could he teach them, these righteous spiritual people? And so verse 34 says, They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and do you teach us? And they cast him out. He received the excommunication that his parents feared. But you know, I don't think this man cared. He had been an outcast all his life. At least he was a seeing outcast now. His life was transformed. And so news traveled to Jesus that this former blind man had been excommunicated out of the temple. And so what does Jesus do? The same thing he did at the beginning. He found this man. We don't know how much time passed. We don't know the emotions of this man. Did he, did he feel rejected? Had his parents rejected him? Had his friends all rejected him? Despite this miraculous thing happened to him. Had everyone else excommunicated him and said, we don't want anything to do with you? Had he been shunned by everyone? Was he all alone now? Whatever the case, Jesus wasn't going to forsake him. Jesus wasn't going to reject him. And though the religious leaders kicked him out of their religion, Jesus would accept him. And so Jesus says in verse 35, says Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Thus thou believe on the Son of God? Of course this man believes. His life had been transformed. But who is he? As he says in verse number 36, and he answered, Who is he, Lord? that I might believe on him. I don't know who he is. All he had done was hear the voice of Jesus. By the time the clay had been removed and he could see, he didn't know who Jesus was. He couldn't see him anymore. He, any guy could have walked by and he wouldn't have recognized Jesus Christ. And so he says, who is he? Who is this guy that changed and transformed my life? And in verse number 37, and Jesus said unto him, thou hast both seen him and it is he that talks with thee. The man could recognize his voice, and now he could see him as well. This man recognizes Jesus, and in verse 38 it says, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. That word worship means to, to prostrate oneself in homage. It, it comes from a Greek word that means to kiss like a dog licking the hand of, a, of their master. So this man falls on, his, on the ground, either on his knees or on his face, and he declares his loyalty to Jesus Christ. Let me draw a couple of applications from this blind man's experience quickly this morning. First of all, I want us to remember that Jesus saw this man in his desperation. He had been an outcast. He had been looked down upon all his life. He had been questioning what happened. Had, why was I born this way? What caused this? Did I sin somehow? Did my parents sin? Everyone looked at him in a, 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 in a negative way that there was something wrong with him because he had, been, had this blindness that they thought only came from someone's personal sin. He was rejected. He was a sinner. He was an outcast. And yet the Bible tells us that Jesus saw him. As he was escaping the stoning by the religious Jews, Jesus Christ noticed this man. And so no matter how the rest of the world might treat us, no matter how the rest of the world might view us, Jesus Christ sees us. And he loves us. 
and he'll care for us, and he'll reach out to us to draw us unto himself. And that's the second point of Jesus drawing us. This man was seemingly unaware of Jesus. In verse number 11 of chapter number 9, it said in verse number 10, it says, How are thine eyes open? In verse 11, he answered, said, A man that is called Jesus made clay. Now remember, Jesus had spent some time healing people by then. He'd been in Jerusalem for some time. His ministry had been going on. People's lives were being transformed. But this man didn't know who Jesus Christ was. He just called him a man called Jesus. He didn't say that man who's been doing all this miraculous work, he came to me as well. He didn't say that man who's been arguing with the Pharisees, he came to me as well. He just said some man named Jesus came to me. He had no idea who Jesus Christ was. He wasn't searching for Jesus Christ as others who had sicknesses were looking to Jesus Christ and calling out to him. Jesus Christ, it seems, came looking for him. It was Jesus who initiated this contact. He was the one that brought the healing to this blind man so that he could see not only Jesus with his eyes, but also with his heart. The healing was not the salvation of this man. He was not saved at the moment of his healing. But this healing was the tool that brought the man to salvation, that brought him to believe that Jesus Christ was who he declared to be. And Jesus will work in our lives to bring us unto himself, even when we're not looking for him. He's reaching out to us. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that he was looking for me when I was not looking for him. He was reaching out to me when I wasn't reaching out to him. And he brought me unto salvation. Jesus Christ loves us and he cares for us. He initiates that contact. Third of all, salvation is always by faith, by belief. This man believed in who Jesus was, not just what he had done. He might not have had all the answers. He declared that Jesus was just a prophet to the religious leaders. But now he believed that he was more than a prophet. He was the Son of God. It said in verse 35, it's Jesus asked him, Dost thou believe on the, on the Son of God? And in verse 38, and he said, Lord, I believe. He didn't know all the answers, but he knew that he'd been blind. And now he could see and only the Son of God could do that for him. And the final thing I want us to notice is that salvation produces worship. When we, are truly, when we truly understand who Jesus is, it changes our lives. We see him for who he truly is, the Son of God. And it causes us to fall down on our face and to worship him. This man had been kicked out of the synagogue. I don't think he cared. Because he'd been received into the family of God. He didn't care that following Jesus made his life a little more difficult on this earth. That Jesus changed him. And so Jesus deserved to be worshipped. See, salvation is a life-changing event. I was blind, but now I see. But as we've seen in this event, not all people believed in Jesus Christ. There were some who saw, but in reality they were blind. It says in verse number 39, And Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remains." As the blind man is worshiping, Jesus declares, this is the reason that I'm here. I've come to set things right. All of those who think that you're right with God, like the Jewish leaders, I've come to judge you and to show that you're really blind. Those who are, like, who are sinners and understand they're sinners, like this man who had been born blind, I've come to judge you and declare you and to make you righteous, to make you whole. See, there were some Pharisees that were following Jesus that, that perhaps uh, to see what trouble that he would cause next, and they, they asked Jesus, what are you saying? What are you trying to get across? Are you declaring us to be blind? Because, you know, blindness only comes as a result of sin. Physical suffering came as a result of sin. Are you calling us sinners? Do you say we have a deformity that's caused by sin? And Jesus Christ is them. You're right. You betcha. That's exactly what I'm saying. If you guys really understood what you were really like and thought this, that what you thought this, this former blind man was, how he was full of sin, you would then be able to see. But because you think you're good, 
Because you think you're okay. Because you don't have any of the sin. Because you have no physical suffering. And you think you're fine because you outwardly keep the law of God. You remain in your sin. You remain blind. See, self-righteousness and pride are the enemies of salvation. Humility and self-awareness are the friends of salvation. These religious leaders thought they were right with God. They thought they had kept the Sabbath day. They didn't break the Sabbath day like other religious people did, like Jesus did. They wouldn't break the Sabbath day and heal people like Jesus would on the Sabbath. How dare he heal people on the Sabbath day? And these guys were a mess to get upset about that. These guys were Jews. They were God's chosen people. They were righteous men. Just ask anyone around. And they would tell you how much they prayed, how much they gave, how much they obeyed God. If anyone was right with God, it was these religious leaders. And yet Jesus stated that their self-righteousness blinded them to their spiritual need of salvation. They were blinded by their pride. And there's a lot of people like that in our world today. There's a lot of people who don't see their need of salvation. They're doing pretty good, at least compared to other people. They're not as bad as other people. They, they might even go to church every single Sunday. They might even follow their, right, their religious teachings that their, their pastor or their, their rabbi or, or their imam teaches them on a regular basis. And they're, they're faithful. They, they obey what their religion teaches. They give money to charity. They help the, the blind people. They're, they're kind to other people. If anybody's right with God, it's them. They're good. Yet, Yet their, their self-righteousness is blinding them to the truth of their spiritual condition. That, that they've sinned against God. God. They've broken God's law by lying, by stealing, by envying, by coveting, by lusting. They have not loved God and they haven't loved other people. They've not looked to God to be their savior and deliverer. They're blind to their spiritual condition. They think they see, but they're really blind. Therefore, their sin remains, for they have not been forgiven of their sins by turning to Jesus. Jesus wants them to understand. He wants everyone to understand what he means by being the light of the world. This is what he's offering. He can take a blind man and not just heal him so he can see, but use him as an illustration to show that this man can not only be, have his eyesight restored to him, but he could have his sins washed away. He could be forgiven of his sins and have a right relationship with God. He was the one that came to bring light to people so they could see who God truly was and what they truly needed. But there are so many people that were walking in blindness. There were so many people walking in darkness. You know, the Bible tells us over and over again as you go through the book of John how John focused on this truth of light and darkness. It tells us in John chapter number 3 that they, they love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. These people love to live in their sin. They love to walk in darkness. And they could not see their own sin. Therefore, they were blind. But when we understand that we're sinners, that we're guilty before God, it's then... That Jesus Christ passes by and he puts a little clay on our eyes and he washes it away and he works in our heart to draw us to the point to where we can say, you are the son of God. You're the only one that could change my life. And we bow down and we worship you. So I ask you this morning, in which of these categories do you find yourself? Can you say I was blind, but now I see? I remember the day that Jesus touched me and changed my life. I remember and understand when I was a sinner and Jesus was my only hope. I know that he alone is the son of God. Or are you more like the religious leaders that think you're okay? You think you're going to get to heaven because you've, you believe in Jesus. You've grown up in a Christian home. You've, you try to do the right things. And so you're, you're okay, but you've never understood that you're truly blind. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. If you were blind, but now can see, could I encourage you this morning to take some time to worship God? Think back to that day. Think back to that day that he transformed your life, how he saved you. How your life was radically transformed by the grace and gospel of Jesus Christ. We might say, Pastor Chris, I was only four or five years old when that happened. My life wasn't that different. Oh, yes, it is. You can think back to all the stuff you avoided in life because that day he changed your life. 
I like to think back from time to time where I would be today if 25 years ago I didn't trust Jesus as my Savior. What would I be doing? Where would I be? What would I be like? And I can tell you my life wouldn't be nearly as great as it is today because Jesus Christ changed me. He's such a mighty God. He's such a wonderful God. If you've been saved, can I encourage you to just worship him this morning? If you've never realized your spiritual blindness, you've always assumed that you could see, can I encourage you this morning just to talk to God about it? Ask him to reveal himself to you and to reveal your true self to you as well. Don't rely on your own righteousness. Don't rely on, on your own good works, but cast your feet and cast yourself at the feet of Jesus Christ this morning and declare him, acknowledge him to be the son of God for only he can transform a sinner like you. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for joining us for part of a Sunday service at Community Baptist Church. I hope to meet you soon. May God impress his love upon your heart this week.